Hello, thank you for showing up uh, to our talk about Captain America and CRISPR. I wanted to start by uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name's uh, Nina Bradshaw. I graduated from, barely graduated from high school in 2002. <laughs> After that, I went into the Navy and operated nuclear reactors for eight and a half years. Um, following <laughs> that, I uh, went back to college, thank you. Um, got a bachelor's degree in chemistry and a I'm now working on my PhD in material science and engineering Woo! at Northwestern, Northwestern University. I am a huge fan of science, but also a really big fan of comic books. About the time I started working on nuclear reactors, I started reading uh, The Avengers. Avengers Disassembled came out shortly afterwards, and then The New Avengers came out along with the House of M saga, and um, I guess I fell in love with the character of Captain America, probably my favorite character of all time. Um, I'm not a huge CRISPR expert, but I do love science, like I said, and I love Captain America, so I'm trying to put together a panel of people that can talk to us about how CRISPR may relate to um, Captain America and how it may be used in the future to create people with traits like Captain America. The idea of this panel is to give a more realistic view of what CRISPR is and maybe talk some uh, about Captain America because he's awesome. Okay. Um, we start with the origins of Captain America, and I wanted to start here because it's really important to the topic of our conversation. There's two parts to the origin of Captain America. One is a super soldier serum, and the other one is vita rays, when you're talking about um, the, idea, the science of how Captain America was created. But I think something that's also important to remember through this conversation is Captain America is Steve Rogers, and he was recruited for a very special reason. And he may have been uh, meek and small, but there were other characteristics they wanted, and they were able to basically take this meek, small person and turn him into somebody who operated at peak performance. Um, so from there, I wanted to go into the panel introductions. Um, so we have three panelists today. Uh, the first one is on the far end is Jordan Harrison. She is getting a bachelor's degree in biology at Northwestern right now. She also works on a podcast called uh, Gene Code. Gene Mods. Gene Mods. Sorry, Gene Mods. Isaac also works on that, in case you couldn't tell. Um, we're also recording this uh, now to play back, to be put onto YouTube later as part of the Gene Mods podcast. I wanted to let everyone in the audience know in case you had any objections to that. It's just going to be Yeah, no faces, just just audio recording. Uh, we're the only ones that get our beautiful faces on the on the video. Um, uh, and she also works with something called uh, Chai Bio. I don't know if you want to talk about that real quick. Uh, Chai Town Bio is a community bio lab, and sorry, uh, Chai Town Bio is a new community bio lab in Chicago. Um, Basically, the goal of our organization is to bring uh, a public lab to our great city of Chicago, um, where basically ordinary citizens, people without a science background, can learn about biotechnology and um, work on their own science projects in sort of a publicly available space. Right now, we don't uh, have that space yet. We're working on uh, getting all that paperwork filed, but. Uh, what we do so far is we do fun sites experiment in bars. Uh, right now we meet in, in, uh, at the Imperial Coal Tap Room in Edgewater. Um, and uh, you can check us, check us out on our website, uh, chitonebio.org, so that's C-H-I, town, bio. Um, we also have a Twitter and a Facebook page if you want to check us out. Also, talk to us after the panel if you want to. We'll be around for a little bit. Um, for the panel, I thought it would also be important to not just talk about science. So we have an ethicist, ethicist with us. Um, that's the other Jordan, Jordan Brown. Uh, she's a gene therapist at, for John, at John Hopkins. Um, she is currently getting her MA in Humanities and Ethics. Um, and she's really interested in the policy of um, gene editing in a clinical setting. Um, and then the last one is Isaac, who will introduce himself. Hi, everybody. I'm Isaac Larkin. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Northwestern. Uh, I actually work on figuring out how to better deliver CRISPR. Um, and I co-host the GMOD podcast with Jordan. Uh, I'm also one of the co-founders of Chi-Town Bio. So I'm 
super into uh, putting the tools and, and knowledge of biotechnology into the hands of anyone who wants to use it to make the world a better place. Uh, so now that we're done with uh, introductions, I think we're going to jump into the science and that's just to give you a foundation of what is CRISPR. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR is a super cool gene editing technique. So the origins of CRISPR are actually found in nature and this is true of I think a lot of gene editing tools. People think like genetic engineering is really scary. Ooh. but Actually, a lot of the techniques that we use are found in nature. So CRISPR is originally um, in nature. It's uh, found in bacteria as a way to protect themselves from viruses. So basically what happens is um, you have three images here, one like sciencey one and then two not really sciencey ones. Um, so basically uh, bacteria use these uh, proteins called Cas9. Uh, paired with something called a guide RNA. So RNA is like the middleman between DNA and proteins in genetics and molecular biology. So they use this RNA that um, has a complementary sequence to some piece of DNA in the genome in the like whole genetic information that you're trying to target. So that RNA matches up exactly with uh, the piece of DNA. So all the A, T, Cs, and Gs are sort of complementary to each other. And what this means is that that RNA sequence will guide this protein to wherever you want in the genome, any sequence of DNA, and it will chop um, and make a cut there. Um, so this is something that bacteria use naturally to cut out virus DNA. So viruses reproduce by inserting all of their genetic information into an organism. So bacteria were able to figure all of that out and be like, come up with this, essentially it's an immune system for viruses. Um, and so we can use CRISPR by editing or by programming that RNA that guides the protein Cas9 to any sequence that we want. So as long as you can uh, find, that, find a sequence and make an RNA for it, you can cut any sequence in the genome that you want. And um, you can also, you can basically, you can add something, delete something. Uh, take something out, um, pretty much anything you want. CRISPR is not the first uh, gene editing tool that's been out there. There are a lot of other different ones, but so far CRISPR has been shown to be one of the easiest to use um, and like most, the cheapest, most accessible ones. Um, we talked a little bit about Triton Bio, um, public labs and like citizen researchers can also use CRISPR. So it's super easy to use. Um, so that's basically CRISPR for you. Um, yeah. So, so you said that like it's used to cut genes out. Do you actually use CRISPR to put genes in also, or is that something else? Yes, you can also use CRISPR to cut genes out. So basically, you can make a cut in the DNA, and it also, you insert a, a along with all the CRISPR machinery, you insert this like donor piece of DNA that gets copied into the, um, into the DNA that you're trying to edit. Yeah, that, that's pretty much exactly right. The, the way I like to think about it at a high level is, it's basically a pair of scissors, and you can program the pair of scissors to cut whatever sequence of DNA you want. And it's a pair of scissors that works like 10 times easier, 10 times cheaper, 10 times faster than any previous pair of scissors that biotechnologists used to use. Exactly. Um, and so it's really powerful, and people have been, it's, it was first applied to sort of <coughs> engineering biology as opposed to, you know, just bacteria fighting viruses uh, back in 2012, and since then, there have been like dozens of companies that have been started, uh, billions of dollars have been invested in uh, research and development that have done CRISPR in uh, monkeys and fish and plants, all these things. And actually just this past month, um, in, in the US, uh, a team of researchers edited a viable human embryo with CRISPR for the first time. It's, they're not gonna implant it and make a baby with it, but it, they've shown that you can use CRISPR on humans. That's a big step showing that you can use CRISPR on humans? I definitely think um, it's a big step and it kind of puts us in a, in a different place ethically than we've dealt with before. I work um, in a whole exome sequencing lab and so what we're doing is we're sequencing. What is an exome just to <laughs> <laughs> So exomes are the parts of our DNA that code for proteins so they're kind of the 
the important instructions of our genetic material. Um, and we do exome sequencing in a lot of kids or a lot of people who have different genetic conditions. Um, and we're already having a big debate within that community of whether or not we should offer tests like exome sequencing prenatally. And I think talking about CRISPR can, and like in the prenatal setting, is kind of a big step when we're already having this discussion and controversy about just testing it for sequence. Yeah, so the, we've already started on this subject, but like what, what's special about CRISPR? I think they've talked about a lot of things, but one of the things I included up here is a, ultimate nullifier, which if you don't know what that is, it's the only weapon that Galactus, the world leader, fears, which is this amazing weapon that they talk about a lot, and I think that when we talk about CRISPR, there's a lot of like big things we talk about, but what are the actual, like, real, what are the limits, or what are the things that's not good at me? Does it do everything? Well, I would say, before I talk about the limits, I just want to talk about one more thing that it can do that I think is crazy. Uh, which is you can program CRISPR into something called a gene drive, uh, which is where you, let's say there's a, an organism like a mosquito that's spreading a disease and it's really, it's really bad, like malaria. You know, malaria kills hundreds of thousands of people every year. Um, you can put CRISPR into the mosquito genome in a way such that um, that uh, uh, CRISPR system is programmed to um, change the mosquito genome so that it's no longer uh, able to host the malaria disease. Um, and then you can program the CRISPR system so that that mosquito passes on that change to all of its offspring, and all of its offspring pass on that change to all of their offspring. So it drives the change through the entire mosquito population over time, over each generation. Um, th so this is something that people are doing research on in labs. They have to do like in containment because they don't want to like accidentally release a gene drive that does something you don't want. Um, uh, but yeah, CRISPR can do a lot of things. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah. Of a Tasmanian devil? No, I was actually going to talk about that. That's that's actually something really cool. Uh, it's also CRISPR related, and that's what we're going to talk about with okay, Captain Mary. Okay, uh, oh, sorry. So yeah, that's um, that's something that people have been thinking about doing for a couple of decades. And there's actually a really great science fiction book by Margaret Atwood called Oryx and Crake, mm -hmm. which I really recommend. And one of the one of the main sort of genetically engineered things in there is uh, pigs that have been engineered to be hosts for organs for human transplants. And there's actually a company that was started either this year or last year uh, called eGenesis, which is working to use CRISPR to not um, insert human cells into pig embryos, but to engineer the pig genome itself so that its organs become compatible with direct transplant into humans. And so part of that is like uh, changing the surface of uh, pig cells so that they no longer are uh, a target for immune reaction by the human immune system. Um, yeah. There's actually also, oh, do you have another question? So, so that is a valid yeah, people are working on it, and investors have paid money to companies that are working on it. I would say it's like just a general. It's not that far off. It's not that far off. I would say as a general scientist, even I sometimes have trouble, like with something that's outside my field, like in biology, which I don't work in a lot. I have trouble telling what the stories I hear like that and what's not. And I would say in this instance, maybe ten years ago, it was very far fetched, but people were saying it's possible, and that now we're a lot closer to believing it's possible and like showing the knowledge, show, showing what we need to for it. But I'm gonna have Jordan actually transition into uh, talking about the, the Tasmanian devil like dog we have here. Okay, yeah. Uh, not actually a Tasmanian devil, but what this is, is a woolly whippet. Um, so when we're gonna start to think about what 
genes could we target that would be good for creating superheroes? We want to think about, well, we want them to be really muscular. So there's this gene that codes for something called myostatin. Um, and basically, myostatin inhibits uh, muscle growth um, in the human body, or in also in, uh, in other animals. So some mutations uh, can turn off myostatin, which means you have lots of muscle growth. So it's sort of a double negative. Um, so basically, with my myostatin is pretty awesome. Um, I don't know if we have any like professional dog breeders in the room, but uh, some people, dog breeders found uh, basically in whippets, the very like skinny kind of dogs, that they found this mutation in the myostatin gene, and they found out that the dogs got like completely jacked when they had this <laughs> when they had this mutation, um, and so that created something called a bully whippet. Um, another thing about genetics. Actually, so you have these bully whippets, uh, and they are really, really muscular, but they don't run as fast. Um, but what some uh, researchers found was that if you have, so everyone has like two copies of genes, including dogs. If you only have one copy of that um, defective myostatin gene, they were kind of muscular and also run really, really fast. So this is something we could potentially use CRISPR for. Like the bully whippets aren't necessarily CRISPR, um, but researchers like were like, wow, this my myostatin gene's really cool. Why don't we uh, use CRISPR with it? And so they tried it on uh, rabbits, also really ripped. Um, beagles, also super strong. Um, so that's something that's super cool can CRISP that CRISPR, CRISPR can do if we're just talking about like really cool CRISPR studies. Do you have any like really cool things, Isaac? So actually, before that, I want to get to the point you made that like a bully with it, right? If it has both those sets of genes, it doesn't run very fast, right? Right, right. But if it has one set, so that's an instance where if we were using something like uh, Isaac's gene drive, where you can put this dominant trait into a population and you could completely drive out the ability for them to run fast. So when we're talking about things like that, do we ever have to worry about like how that's going to affect it or if the gene drive, is that reversible? Can you go back and fix it? Oh, absolutely. Um, so. The, the simplest form of a gene drive um, is not uh, super reversible. However, um, uh, researchers are working really hard to build um, safer versions of gene drives that uh, can be reversed if something, if you accidentally push an unwanted trait through a population. Um, I would also say there are limitations to gene drives, and they're connected to some of the limitations of CRISPR generally. Um, like, CRISPR is not 100% efficient at uh, cutting the DNA. And even when it makes the cut, it may not, it might not make the change that you want when it cuts the DNA. So like, for instance, when you're, when you're trying to do a gene drive, a lot of the times what you want is to make a cut and then to make a precise edit, so a, a precise change in the DNA sequence at that spot. What can happen instead is you make the cut and then the cell's machinery just sort of like sloppily stitches the DNA back together and then you introduce this mutation that changes the sequence there and so the CRISPR no longer recognizes that sequence and can't target it anymore, but it didn't make the change you wanted. And so that sort of efficiency of editing limitation is something that people are running up against and that are trying to sort of work around. Yeah, yeah and we're also thinking about, like, is CRISPR this as awesome as everyone thinks it is? There are other, um, it is really awesome, but there are other limitations as well. Sometimes CRISPR can also cut in a place completely different from where it's supposed to cut. Off target. Yeah. yeah, we call them off target effects. Um, so it just binds incorrectly to the DNA. Um, so that's kind of the science, I guess. Like that's the foundation of what we're gonna talk about for the rest of it. And the next question you would ask yourself in the process of this is, uh, what do you want from a super soldier? Like what do you want him to be able to do? And the obvious one is like, you may want him super muscular, but there's been some other things that you might want as well, or there's been some looking into this? Um, another, uh, I think, big, big factor would be endurance. Um, so there's, there's a lot of genes that you could factor into this. Um, there's one gene that um, affects uh, the way your body carries oxygen in your blood that makes that more efficient and we see uh, variants of that in like mutations of that in people who live in really high altitudes. Is that right, Isaac? Yeah, like uh, indigenous people in like the Andes and also Himalayas uh, tend to have 
higher red blood cell counts. And so that they, that if you had that, you would, it's kind of like a natural version of doping. So you, you just uh, you get more oxygen from the air that you breathe. So we'll see it in the Tour de France in two years. <laughs> What about you, Isaac? Do you have more examples? Yeah. So if you're if you're going for strength, myostatin is a good way to go. Um, if you want to run really fast, there are and so um, basically uh, scientists have been studying human genomes for the past few decades, as long as you've seen this, um, and uh, they've been able to find like certain pieces of DNA in different genomes are associated with uh, different sort of uh, unusual physical abilities. So um, People who are like world-class sprinters tend to have a different variant of um, this gene for actin, which makes up part of the muscle fibers. Um, and so their, their actin genes twitch more quickly than uh, the average actin gene. Um, so that's one. Uh, yeah. So they also looked into this for things like astronauts as well, so they can be on. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a, um, there's a professor at Harvard named George Church, who is sort of one of the, the leaders in the field of synthetic biology, and he has this list of um, genes that are, are his wish list for if he could engineer humans to make them better astronauts and make them better able to live in space, these are the, the, the genes that he would uh, tweak. And so there's one variant that leads people to have uh, much sort of stronger and denser bones, which is good because in space you tend to lose bone mass because you're not fighting in gravity all the time. Um, and there are other variants that um, Reduce your ability to feel pain, um, and there which could be good or bad. Yeah, good, good or bad. Superior uh, to Yeah. Also, like, plays into a lot into like risk taking. You know, sometimes you need to have, feel pain to know that like you're in danger. Anyway, keep going. Yeah, George Church's dream is to like put the ability to feel pain under like voluntary control of the human mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I would say generally speaking, the same traits that you would want to engineer into an astronaut are traits that you might engineer into just like a super soldier. I think it's really important to think about though that when we talk about like traits like this, like strength and like, height, intelligence, um, there are these variants that have big effects. Um, but most of the time, things like this are controlled by lots and lots and lots of genes and also by the environment. So there was a study that was done a couple years ago that found that just for the trait of height, so how tall you are, includes about 400 different genes. Um, and then taking all, that, all of that into account, probably it's more affected by like how good of nutrition you had as a child or something. So we can use CRISPR to edit a lot of these different genes, but really it's gonna be, most of the time they're gonna be small effects that are compounded by lots of different genes. And I think the whole off-target effects problem gets bigger when you're trying to edit lots of genes at the same time. So there's a limit to how much we can do with that. Yeah, do you have a question? Oh, you're getting ahead of us. <laughs> that is an excellent question. Yeah, well, I mean, it leads into an ethics question, but we're also going to talk about that next. I did want to, I did want to touch on the ethics real quick before we get too far into this. We're talking about editing, like. Oh, also, was there someone else with a question? Oh yeah. I know with Captain America, they made him sort of think faster, not so much a higher Oh yes, the, the question was, um, Captain America has been engineered to have a higher or faster uh, thinking rate, not necessarily more intelligence, but he thinks through things faster and um, if we would be able to uh, do something like that, with, or CRISPR would be able to uh, give someone a faster thinking rate. I am not a neuroscientist, I'm not super sure on this one. So one of the things that um, has come out of the last 20 years of genomics is that intelligence is a lot like height. It's a, it's a characteristic that it arises from a ton of different genes, each having a small effect. And so there aren't a lot of known uh, variants in the genome that 
confer uh, a really strong like heightened intelligence or heightened speed of thinking or something like that. I think you were talking about though in the whole list of genes that you had that we were talking about, Isaac, um, a variant somewhere in there that um, is common to people who have lower anxiety. Is that something that you had found in your research? Yes, yes. There, there are variants that um, sort of are associated with higher levels of stress or lower levels of stress. Um, there's also variants that are associated with, um, like, there's one variant where if you if you overexpress a stress receptor, like, there's an entire family that's like super prone to violent crime <laughs> because they're they're always like in fight or flight mode because uh, they have these this, they have this receptor over. So potentially, if you have like lower stress, uh, if you have more stress tolerance, you can probably think faster on your feet. I guess. Yeah, maybe. Actually, maybe something. I think the 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 thing that y'all might be dancing around is the idea that like sometimes you can point to a gene and say this will change this thing exactly, but a lot of the times you're going to point to a gene and say this may have a this has an effect on it, but we don't always know how because there's like a lot of factors. Would that be more accurate? Yeah, definitely. Do you think that plays into when you're talking about people with gene therapy or thinking about the idea of actually editing because the idea that it might not like changing one gene might not work or how yeah in genetic counseling we uh, work with a lot of single gene disorders and even within those syndrome uh, associations of single genes where we know a mutation that is one gene causes these problems there's still a lot of variance um, and, and we're talking about more multifactorial meaning that there are many factors many genes contributing so we don't even we can't even really predict how single gene mutations will play out through mutations. Like it's hard to imagine um, really guessing what a multifactorial gene is. Yeah. So his question is, if we're able to give somebody a pill that like makes CRISPR happen and they were to take it, how would they actually transition from uh, the person they are to the person uh, they have? Which kind of transitions into like our next topic on the slides. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you have an answer for that specifically. Well, I feel like it would depend on what kind of change you were trying to make. I would, generally speaking, it would the, the transition would take probably at least on the order of a week to several weeks um, because you have to uh, you have to get the gene editing stuff into the cell and that probably takes like a day or so. You have to then have the, the CRISPR cut the DNA and that probably takes a, uh, another day or so and it needs to then make the change. And once it's made the change, you have that change in the DNA, but the DNA is like the cookbook and you still need to like make the recipe. And so you have to express all the genes. And so the cells can start expressing the genes over the course of a few days. But if you want to like have the sort of like, let's say you wanted to get bulkier muscles, um, that would be a process of like several weeks. So, right so that kind of leads into your research also. Like, so do we just take a pill? Do we take a shot? Like, like how do we actually like go through the process of saying, like injecting this into Human or a, another species that we're trying to do CRISPR with? How do we deliver it, basically? Yeah, so delivery is actually the rate-limiting challenge for these gene editing technologies at the moment, because it, it turns out that cells have evolved to try to keep things out, because things that, you know, viruses are the kind of thing that tries to get into a cell, and uh, so it's difficult to get something large and bulky, like a Cas9 um, protein, or like a gene for a Cas9, from the outside of a cell membrane to the inside of a cell membrane. Um, there are several ways to solve this problem. Um, the most popular one currently is actually to use a viral vector. So viruses have evolved over billions of years to be very, very good at getting inside cells. And so what you do is you basically take a, a viral shell, you scoop out the inside of it um, uh, with genetic tools to replace the virus genome with the DNA that you want to deliver into the cell. And then once you, you can basically deliver the gene for expressing the Cas9 protein in the guide RNA, 
and also the, the DNA that you want to repair uh, the cut site with. Uh, so that's one way that's very popular. Um, another way to do it is to use nanotechnology. Um, so basically, uh, you can encapsulate uh, your Cas9 protein in a little tiny ball of grease, basically. And the outside of a cell is also made of grease. And so the grease from the ball will interact with the grease in the cell membrane, and it'll sort of fuse together, and it will release the um, Cas9 protein onto the inside of the cell. And that's tricky to do, um, but if people have been able to, um, if they're, they're getting really good at doing that in sort of uh, in a test tube in cell culture, and they can do it a little bit um, in living animals as well. Uh, it depends on, uh, it, it, the challenge is sort of getting the, the little tiny grease balls to go to the right place. Right now, a lot of them just end up in the liver. So if you wanted to make a super liver, you could probably do that now. But um, making like super eyes is harder. Also, did that get at your question, or do you, were you thinking more in like an existential kind of thing? He was asking, like, what would be kind of a timeline, uh, and what would it look like, say, to change eye color um, if, if we were to use CRISPR to change eye color? Okay. So sort of like a less existential question, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah. Um, so the idea of a super soldier serum and binaries, which is kind of what we're talking about, like a delivery system, do you think that's something that's like, like you could use some sort of ray designed with, like, uh, serum to create a uh, super soldier, I guess? Yeah, so if we were to you know, draw the analogy to Captain America and you wanted to you wanted to do some sort of gene editing to make Captain America using uh, serum and virus, what I would do is make the serum contain nanoparticles that basically are activated and, and release their cargo uh, when you shine heat on them, uh, infrared light. Um, and then the fighter rays would be the infrared. Um, and so people actually use this for drug delivery to cancer sometimes. Uh, that's the, what they're working on. So you basically inject someone with a bunch of nanoparticles and they go all throughout the body, but then you shine infrared light on the tumor. And so the nanoparticles pop uh, inside the tumor and release their carbon. So you could imagine if you wanted to, for instance, selectively edit the eyes of someone or, um, or your hair, uh, you just shine, shine infrared light there, and your delivery vehicle in the super serum would release there. Would that light be as like massively intense as in the first Avenger movie? <laughs> no. Okay, yeah. Not, really. not that. Uh, not enough infrared. Traumatic. To you. Yeah. Do you have a question? I actually love that this panel is giving us perfect transitions into like our next <laughs> slides yeah, because asking the, the right questions. The right questions. You guys um, are a great so the question is, her, her question is, is there worry about mental health if you're going through this and creating superheroes? And I kind of wanted to get to the broader question of, do we need super soldiers, right? Because Captain America is one of a kind. He was created at a time when America was fighting Nazis in another country, um, and. Uh, there was there was this need for him, right? And also like super patriotic and like the the place America was in there is someplace very different than we are now. So I think that there's like two broad questions there. One, like what are the implications of going through and creating super soldiers, right? Just like one or the idea of creating large numbers of them and how does it change things? And I don't know that we have the answers to that, but maybe like can touch on the ethics of like this idea of creating like uh, humans operating in peak performance versus the ones out there who just every day look at people like us. I also want to get to your question just very briefly. I think it all goes back to the fact that there are so many genes that are involved in one trait and the fact that single genes can have 
a lot of different effects of different traits. So it's possible that we would make a gene edit that in, like, has, does something to muscles and maybe it also has an effect in the brain. So sometimes we don't really know. So that's, that's definitely a good question. apply in ethics we like to apply different like ethical lenses to the situation so one of them that gets applied a lot is what principle is like and that's looking at what four main principles beneficence non-maleficence justice and autonomy and if we use those ideas the idea that we're doing good that we're not doing harm that people are able to make their own decisions and that those decisions are made for the greater good I think um, you could come to multiple conclusions using those and thinking about good for to create superhumans. Um, but I think there are so many unknowns, especially with what effects these changes could have on down the line. That if you think about it through the lens of non-maleficence, um, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, so what, I guess, this may be putting you on the spot, and I kind of want to ask the, the two people who like work with this, this kind of uh, genetic tool, I guess, like, What's your what's your thoughts just generally on should we go through and make these changes to humans to make them stronger? I mean, like eliminating malaria is an example you used, which kills millions of people. But like, what if we we're just talking about like why don't we make everyone stronger or think faster? Like, how do you feel about that? I my take on that is my biggest worry about human gene editing is who has access to these therapies. So I think a big problem could be like, if you've seen, has anyone seen the movie Gattaca? Okay, yeah. a couple of people. So the idea that you can have, you can develop a genetic underclass, so some people in a society can be made to be like stronger and smarter, some people aren't. So I think if you have to think about if everyone has access to this kind of technology, um, Jordan, do you have any insights on that as well? Um, on to what is that? Democratizing. Democratizing this kind of technology. Like making it cool for everybody? So like a, if, it, if it costs a million dollars to have your genes edited, right, to make you this superhuman, like not everybody, most people couldn't do that, right? right. So the idea of like making it something that's expensive and will be available to people versus like everyone. I mean, I think there's definitely, um, I could definitely go pretty bad direction <laughs> very quickly. Um, but I think it could also be used for a lot of good if the resources were played out so that those who needed changes were able to get them, or who needed certain therapy were able to get them. But I think if it were just kind of uh, advertised as just pay a lot of money and get really strong, um, it could definitely lead to do you think that um, from a policy standpoint, because you're interested in the policy of like in a clinical setting, do you think that there's policy out there that could be used to like help with that process of limiting like whether it's just available to a few people? Yeah, I think our healthcare policy has a lot of problems as it stands now. Um, but I, I'm thinking of the way we do genetic testing right now and how it's really offered to people based on social class plays a huge role in who is offered genetic testing. And when you think of doing genetic testing for things like cancer predisposition, and then those people may have different management and screening to lower their cancer risk, whereas people who aren't able to afford, afford health insurance may not be able to have had that genetic test in the first place. Um, I think that can kind of could foreshadow where offering something like CRISPR to the general public on the basis yeah, we actually have a question right here first. Yeah. The, the question is, is what are the conversations going on about um, healthcare policy, patents, and other things related to CRISPR? And I don't. I don't really know what those conversations are, honestly. I don't know if they're, they're still kind of having that testing about things that are way before talking about CRISPR. I can tell you a little bit about where we're at right now. So right now, CRISPR is patented, but the license is being shared fairly freely, um, uh, particularly for academic research. Um, in terms of 
health policy, um, the FD or yeah, the FDA is currently not allowed to consider trials for um, editing um, the human germline. So that would be human eggs and sperm, something that would be passed on. They are allowed to consider trials for editing like uh, human body cells, basically. Yeah, there are more. So CRISPR is not just one protein. Uh, CRISPR is actually a whole family of proteins. So the whole uh, process of CRISPR uh, being patented was uh, hugely is sort of a bloodbath right now. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of different proteins. Uh, there's like Cas3, Cas2, CPF1. There's like a lot of different ones, and those all get different patents. Um, and you can also have patents for different uses of CRISPR if they're not obvious uses. Yeah, uh, I mean, I would say biotech patents, I think, are generally messed up in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which they're messed up is uh, you can patent a, um, a useful protein and like all proteins that are like 90% similar to that useful protein. So it, that makes it difficult to just be like, okay, well, this protein from this bacteria is patented, I'll just go to this other related bacteria, splice out the, the same related protein to use it for stuff. That, that may be more of a comment on how patent law in America works and how awful it is. Yes. In a lot of cases, <laughs> than on like the free IP. IP. And, and we've kind of transitioned into the last point, which is just, just general question. Did you have a question also? Yeah, um, I was wondering about how It depends on where you're edited. So uh, in your case, if you're edited in your testes, then odds are good that you might be able to pass that on. Um, or, so, so the way that you create heritable changes, the, the, the easiest way to make a heritable change is to um, create an embryo through IVF. So basically take um, an egg cell from a woman and sperm cell, fertilize them in a test tube, and then do CRISPR on that. And that's the way you get sort of the edit in every single cell in the body and it'll then be passed down on the future generations. And so that's a very controversial subject. Um, the first successful test of that just happened last month in the US. It, it, is all, it had previously happened like two years ago in China as well on non-viable embryos. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot going on there. You, you actually had a question right there. Did you? No? I saw your hand first, sorry. That's, yeah. Um, so, with this uh, like, this method by testing, I'm curious about like, how mutagens or different like, drug companies like this, they end up creating more powerful drugs for specific drug testing sites. Is that just how it works? Or is it like the same story for the same drug for like, for everything in the area or everything in different diseases for you end up being a more powerful drug? So, a really good question, and yes, that is a major challenge for um, success, designing successful gene drives to, say, eliminate malaria. Um, one of the things you have to be careful about if you make a gene drive is it, uh, there are like a few different ways you can do it. You could potentially tweak the mosquitoes so that they just are no longer a hospitable host for the malaria parasite, but you could also do it so that like the mosquitoes start dying. Um, and uh, you can engineer gene drives that like reduce mosquito fertility over time. But if you're doing that and you're ma making a trait that is sort of harmful to the population, individuals just by chance will evolve resistance to that. And so it, it becomes a difficult uh, challenge of how do you, it's, it's a constant war of how do you uh, deal with that. Yeah, um, evolution always finds a way. Actually, we've, we've just hit time. Uh, I did, want to thank everyone. This is my first panel, and actually all of our first panels uh, at a Comic-Con. Uh, you were a super great audience. I think that people are willing to stick around.
and answer questions if you have more questions. I'm actually going to run out. I have a wedding to be at in Logan Square in like an hour. So, but uh, I think that everyone else is willing to uh, stick around and answer other individual questions possibly. Thank you. Yeah, and just one last takeaway for everyone, just to put this back in terms of comics. The one thing you'll notice in a lot of comics, Captain America, um, you know, the, the Americans were losing to the Nazis, and that was why Captain America was created. Um, and in other things, you know, a lot of superheroes gain their powers by accident or because they're facing some sort of insurmountable challenge. And so I think that, that tells you a lot about the conditions under which it's sort of ethically acceptable to become a superhero. And the, the other thing you'll notice is that the people in comic books who seek out sort of biological augmentation just to make themselves better, those tend to be the supervillains. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Shytown Bio. One last shameless. And G Mods. Thank you.